how often are you taking inventory of your abilities? What's up, Active Lifers? Welcome back to the Active Life Podcast. I'm Dr. Sean Pastuch. I'm your host, and today's guest is Dr. Mark Chang. Mark is a prolific martial artist and a well-known rehab expert out on the West Coast coming out of LA. I found Mark on Instagram because as a father raising my kids, I see the way that he raises his daughter on his social media channels in a way that is so inspiring to me that I just wanted to start to learn more from this guy. And the more that I was learning, the more that I was seeing that there were layers and depth to the relationships that he was developing, to the work that he was doing, and to the things that he is passionate about. On today's show, we talk about how to take inventory of your abilities to make sure that you are eliminating the weaknesses that you may or may not be aware of in your life. From parenting to working as a business person, to being a rehab specialist, to getting through difficult situations like, for example, COVID when his businesses were shut down for an excessive period of time in which he thought he was going to lose them. Remember, if you enjoy this podcast, please go to wherever you're listening, leave us a rating, write us a review, share it with a friend. Sharing is caring and that's how this thing grows. And if you're finding value from it, you want others to find it too. Let's get you to the show. Dr. Mark Chang, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. Good morning, sir. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. You, you're somebody who I've been watching for a long time because I, I, I love the way that you speak. It's so intentional and your actions always follow that speak. And I make it a point to try to get people like that in my life. So thank you for joining me. Well, thank you. Uh, hopefully, I'll li- I'll do a better job of living up to that too. Now that I've heard that such generous words, I'm I'm certain you're already doing it. <laughs> I want to start off by diving right into what what you describe as a life well lived. So, at Active yep. Life, we we say that we need to evolve fitness to function as healthcare in pursuit of a life well lived. I saw a post that you made back on December 22nd, if I'm not mistaken, where in 2022, where your daughter was asking you for uppy and she's, <laughs> she's 10, she's 10, I guess. And, and you, you said, you know, you asked her to say it again, you picked her up on your shoulder. And then it was that little moment that a lot of people I think have, have the opportunity to just take for granted. Like, Oh, okay, come on up you made a point to make a post out of it and share why it was so important to savor a moment like that. I would love for you to speak to that. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you lobbed that over for me in a beautiful way. Um, Can you, can I trouble you to repeat what you said as far as like that mission statement that you, that you mentioned at at the beginning? Sure. So we say that we need to evolve fitness to function Uh as healthcare in pursuit of a life well lived. Okay. So the fitness allows us to like the strength allows us to capitalize on opportunities. You know, we can have opportunities in terms of our time, right? And if you, if we have those opportunities and we don't have the strength, those opportunities then become burdens. If we have the strength, then those opportunities become, become like fertile fields for joy, right? Like we can just like, if we're, let's say picking up our kids If we don't have the strength, like the inventory of strength, I like to use that word inventory quite a lot. If we don't have the inventory or the ability, like inventory of abilities to be able to do something, then we have to borrow. And in that borrowing, it becomes a strain. It becomes an effort. It becomes some sort of distress rather than a eustress. Um, And for the people that aren't familiar with those terms, like if we look at stress, a lot of times stress gets a bad rep. Because like the people go, oh my God, everything, everything that's bad in the world or in our lives or in our health is because of stress. Actually, stress, we can look at it in a yin and a yang kind of lens, right? Like distress or the word distress, like if we look at that, those are stressors that cause our body to maladapt. Eustress, spelled E-U, and then stress, the word stress, those are stressors or those are stimuli that allow our bodies to adapt in a positive fashion to create some sort of like growth, right? So if we have a requisite amount of strength that we've built up or a requisite amount of ability that we've built up already, then we have more opportunities available to us. Those are eustresses. Like I can seize on this or I can seize on this or I can seize on this and it will, it will elevate me. It will like 
provide me with a better life and it will it will ideally provide other people with a good experience as well if i don't have that strength like let's say oh man my neck is hurt my back is hurt like i'm too tired whatever like i don't have the inventory of ability to be able to pick up my daughter right then my 10 year old when she's like dada pick me up so when you guys in the audience heard the word uppy let's clean let's make sure that you understood that cleanly as different from upper <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah but so, my 10 year old was not asking for uppers <laughs> <laughs> well so i don't know if you've heard the story that i've shared on this podcast and on my instagram before but back in july of this year we went to a block party my family and i and my middle daughter is a five-year-old soon to be six-year-old bowling ball Right, like mm-hmm. she weighs the same as our eight year old kid. She's just a dense little kid. And she was asking if I would carry her home on my shoulders, sitting on my shoulders. I oh. have a fairly severely degenerated disc in my neck, and oh. it was symptomatic when she asked. Mm-hmm. And in the moment, I was I was stressed because we were at the party later than I wanted to be. I was mm-hmm. stressed because I was in significant pain. And then mm-hmm. my daughter asked if she could get on my shoulders. And I, I immediately said, not right now. Daddy doesn't feel like it. And I regretted it a millisecond after it came out of my mouth. And the next day, I reached out to a member of our team at Active Life and said, I need to say yes every time my kid asks me this for the rest of my life. And so I started making the entire focus of my training to be able to have no excuses to say yes to that. And when you speak about the inventory of availability, you're, that's a perfect way to describe it. Because for me, living, a, living life well means I'm always dealing with the choice. I can choose no, but it's a choice, right? I, I, I could also choose yes to whatever it is. Totally. I mean, th- to speak to your example, to what you um, went through during that block party, there was a time too, like right, I think maybe like two weeks after I made that post of uh, the uppy post that, um, you know, I'd had a long day, was training the whole nine yards and I just got out of the car to pick her up and I, and I was just, my back was a little bit um, less than comfortable. And I just felt like, okay, I could carry her to the car, but like I'd be borrowing to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and rather than run the risk of doing that and then being, you know, potentially have dealing with a potentially aggravated situation after that, I just said, you know, baby, can I, can I carry you next time? And like this time, maybe can you like koala? So what we do is koala, we call it like a front pack. She'll like hug around my, hug her arms around my neck and then wrap her legs around my waist. So it's like having a backpack in the front. And so rather than holding her in just one arm and like carrying her off, like just in one arm and having the other hand totally free, her weight centered over me. And then like, I can still be close to her, still allow her to feel close to me. Um, and then, you know, get the walk in. So I think having scalability and having options is just as important as having inventory. So like the more options we have, the more inventory we actually create. I think that's beautiful. I never thought to do something like that. Now the first thing I'm going to do when I get home tonight is teach all three of my daughters how to koala. Yeah. So in having long hair, um, and putting your kids on your shoulders, they're going to be sitting on your hair unless you're super careful about like pulling your hair out of the way at the same time. Um, so I, in, in order to avoid having that hair pulled on and also just to feel closer heart to heart, like mechanically closer heart to heart, um, we did this thing called front pack. So like it's, it's almost like as if you're wearing a backpack on the front. Mm-hmm. So I'd have them wrap their arms around my neck and then wrap their legs around my waist. Um, and so it also becomes a good drill as far as for grappling as well. So. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that it, it speaks to your resourcefulness around things that are important to you. And there's, I was on a podcast recently with a friend of mine, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and I was talking to mm-hmm. her about um, my experience going through Hurricane Sandy and the opportunity mm-hmm. that it presented for me to recreate myself, recreate my businesses. And it wasn't until like 45 minutes later or 30 minutes later, whatever it was, that she was like, I heard you say Hurricane Sandy lost my businesses and opportunity. And I hear the same thing in you describing this. It might not be a natural disaster, right? You've had your own fair share of things that have you've had to deal with, I'm sure. But it's the, it's the mindset of looking for solutions where problems present themselves instead of facing a problem and stopping. Your hair is 100%. Long. 
right? That's just your example. The hair being long. It's, right. it, but it, what, it, what it tells me is that when problems come up, you look for solutions instead of reasons to just succumb to the problem. Right. I mean, it's, it, I've, I found out that there's times when like you can get, it, it's too easy to fall into that downward spiral of moping of like feeling like, Oh my God, I'm so overcome by the severity or the intensity or the drama of, or the, like the magnitude of this problem or the uniqueness of this problem that like something I've never seen before. Oh my God, what do I do? Um, but rather than feeling that overwhelmed and staying with that feeling, like maybe feeling that in j- just for a moment, but then also too, like my mind is wired to be able to look for, okay. Um, actually just to use a, a perfect example. I remember one time when I was a teen, there was some dude on TV. I wish I'd paid more attention back then. There's some dude on TV talking about the best time to buy stocks. And as a teen, I didn't know Jack about stocks. And he said like, look, really looking at this market the right now, right now, it seems like everything's going south. It seems like everyone's losing money. But really, like the smart money knows that the best time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I will never forget that phrase. When there's blood in the streets is the best time to buy. And, I, and it was like, wow, that means that there's tons of opportunity. Like the people that are smart, the people that are successful, the people that are, that are like rolling the big dough. They're looking at these disastrous moments or these moments when everyone else is freaking out and thinking it's a calamity as opportunity. And I was like, wow, that's, that's the shift. Well, so it's a perfect segue. You to, to use your language, you're lobbing it back to me in, right on, in 2020, you were running your K3 combat course, which was teaching people about how to develop longevity, right? In person, yes. in person. Yes. Uh, you had a successful clinic and mm-hmm. then you're in East LA, which is the east of LA, which right. is which is not exactly the um, most free place to be when what happened in March of 2020 went down. Right. So I imagine there had to be a moment there for you where you were like, "Oh shit! My entire livelihood is based on people traveling to see me in person, face to face, and now." The government is telling me I'm not allowed to do that. Okay, two weeks, no big deal. Okay, two months. Now we're starting to have a little bit of a problem. This is going to be how long? I'm curious how your mind that goes through adversity and that what's the solution dealt with that. Yeah, so like uh, I had a I had a clinic in Santa Monica, which is on the west side, very close to the beach. Um, I live out in the far, the quote unquote far east of LA in Diamond Bar. So the commutes were. Um, less than fun Mm -hmm. and still are, you know, when I go to the West side, they're less than fun, but the people that I work with are awesome. K3 was taking off. Um, K3 for those of K3 combat movement systems, for those of your listeners who haven't heard of it um, is a training program that I developed along with Dr. Jimmy Yuan um, that looks at time honored training practices practiced and used by warrior cultures that actually feed the longevity and athleticism of the practitioner. Um, and they, all of them inherently have some sort of restorative value. So it's not just martial arts for combative sake, but, but martial arts training practices for longevity sake. Um, we'd done a few uh, workshops. We'd done one here in LA. We'd done one in New York and we, we had just finished one at on it, um, at, on it headquarters, um, in Austin. And we were riding the, the momentum from that, um, you know, things were for awesome. And then when the pandemic broke out, it was like Murphy's law, a whole bunch of things went wrong almost all at the same time. Um, my father, uh, who's a known engineering at the time, I believe he was 92 had a fall, um, and suffered a skull fracture. Oh. So like, yeah, complex temporal bone fracture. Luckily he's been rehabbed. Um, I had the good fortune to be able to oversee that myself. So he's, he's better. He's back moving around, four inch emotion, just slightly forgetful, but you know, in the nineties and for someone in his nineties, he's allowed that. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's 95 now. Yes. Correct. Okay. Correct. So, yeah. Um, as far as the clinic went, you know, a lot of my, my patient roster were small business owners 
Um, and so a lot of these people who were restaurateurs, gym owners and the like, martial arts school owners, um, because of the shutdowns, their in their discretionary income had had been severely curtailed. Um, and so, like, my message to them was, look, if you guys are hurting, you can't work. And if you can't work, you can't earn and you won't be healthy. And then there'll be that snowball effect. I'm not worried about your money. Like, come in as often as you need. Like, I've got you taken care of. Um, and that was fine for a while. And then it got to the point where just people were so overwhelmed with, like, I got to do this PPP pr- paperwork or whatever kind of paperwork. And um, the stressors of just handling the daily occupied them so much that they weren't making time for their own wellness. So a lot of that, you know, compounded. And uh, honestly, for myself, like as much as I loved being in practice uh, and, and seeing patients, I didn't really enjoy the drive all the way out to the West side. You know, I used to live on the West side and so it was fine. But, um, you know, a few years, several years ago, maybe like six, seven years ago, I moved out here to diamond bar. Um, and so the commute was less than fun. Um, so that had to change. Uh, what else during the pandemic? Oh yeah. You know, the workshops got curtailed because like right when was it, all, was it 20, 2020? Yeah, yeah, 2020. So like my 2020 and my 2020 and 2021 calendar, like all of 2020 and part of 2021 were already booked, like mm-hmm. beautifully booked. I'm looking at this going like, mm, since moving out to Diamond Bar, this is going to be like my most lucrative year yet. It's just as far as right. workshop income. And then all of a sudden I look at the, the, the pandemic and it's like, this needs to cancel. This needs to be canceled. This needs to be canceled. This needs to be canceled. Screw it. Let's just wipe the whole calendar because like this is just not going to fly and we can't bank on it being three months. We can't bank on it being six months. We just don't know. There's mm-hmm. too many variables. So let's just wipe the calendar. That way no one is beholden to an event that may or may not be able to happen. Mm-hmm. So I looked at all that and like income wise, I'm looking at that and just nodding my head going like, well, this is not ideal. This, or at least this is, let me rephrase that. I think I said, this is not what I expected. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I said the word, this is not ideal. I think I pretty, I'm pretty, con- pretty confident that I said, this is not what I expected. And I looked at those times and, and like the kids are being homeschooled virtually, right? Um, my parents were here with me at the time because dad was convalescing. Um, I go, man, this is kind of what I wanted for forever, right? Like, My parents and my kids are under the same roof with me. Like I get to take care of my parents. I get to take care of my dad. I get to be quarterbacking his recovery because a, I have the skills and I have the means, but like now I'm also physically close enough to, because before they lived in Delaware. So Mm. like, um, they just happened to be visiting when the pandemic shut everything down. Good time. Talk about serendipity. What serendipity. And then like, I'm always looking forward to stealing time with my kids. Always. Um, because as you know, any parent of teens or college age kids will tell you like steal those moments because by the time they get to high school and college age, they're going to fly the coop. And then you're going to wish you spent more time with them when, you know, you actually have the opportunity to. So at that time I was like, man, this is awesome. I get to sleep in late. I get to be with my kids. I get to, you know, take care of my parents and I get to like, you know, be present and just focus on being present. Now, the difficulty was having faith that eventually things would work itself out in terms of income, in terms of being able to stay solvent, everything else. But, you know, it, really, uh, some of it was good luck. Some of it was just not spending the energy stressing myself out on what I couldn't control. How many conversations do you think you had with yourself to get to that place? Um, I'm a big proponent of the fuck it mentality. Okay. So like, if there's something I can control, I'm, I'm in, like, I will figure out ways to most, or we'll try to figure out ways to most effectively and efficiently apply my energy. If something is out of my hands, stressing about it doesn't really help me. Um, and if it's just outside of reach and I can reach for it, great. But if it's something that's truly outside of my hands, like, 
I don't have the power to decide government policy. You as don't. A single- the, th- the thing I'll push back on you there a little bit, because I, I want to hear how this teases out in your brain. I'm interested in this <clears throat> is <clears throat> I'm very much the same. Like I remember, um, at some, I think it was March 16th, maybe of 2020, we recorded mm-hmm. a video and put it online that said, this thing is coming. Like okay. it, it, it's, it's coming and it doesn't matter what your friend Timmy on Facebook thinks he's an accountant and uh-huh. he has no idea. Your business is going mm-hmm. to be affected by this. Prepare now, get yourself in a good shape. Um, yes. and for me, that was like, we at, at that point had gone ahead and I had the same thing as you. I had 14 seminars scheduled around the United States between that date and January the following year. They were all going to fill. We were going to crush it. And it was an immediate, mm-hmm. okay, this, this isn't going to happen. So let's just cancel yep. all of them. And what are we going to do instead? The stressful thing for, for me was having awareness around what do I have control over and what don't I have control over? I think I have control over this. And I'll give you an example of this in a second. Oh, it turns out I actually don't have control over that either. And so where mm. like the example of that would be where I said, fuck it. We're going to go ahead and we're going to take all of these seminars we were going to travel the country for. We're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars to turn our office that we had just leased, by the way, six and a half thousand square mm-hmm. feet to move staff out and do seminars all the time. Um, mm-hmm. We had we're like, forget it. Let's turn this place into a film studio. Right. Brilliant. So let's get all the equipment and we'll, we'll do that. Oh yeah. There's a four month wait on that light mm-hmm. right there's oh there's a, there's a six month wait on that camera now mm-hmm. that's where i was like okay well what do we do now then because these things that we thought would be readily available that i thought were within our control or not fuck it what do we do next that's where i felt the stress mm-hmm. do you follow me there 100 percent. trying to become aware of like what are my options so it goes mm-hmm. back to what we we're saying about options like whether it's putting the kids on my shoulders or having them front pack or just even just holding hands or, you know, walking alongside, we're still connected We're they know I'm so close to them, but like, these are just options. And the, the vibe between me and the kids is really like the deciding factor. Like as long as I communicate well and they know that I care about them, but there's some extenuating circumstance, which is why we're not doing up or whatever, then we're good. When, you don't have the opportunity to have like a particular item that you need. And you know, you're searching for that item or searching for an, a, an acceptable option, right? Like an alternative, like, could I use a different kind of light? Okay. There there's, there doesn't seem to be any kind of light that mm-hmm. serves that purpose. Can I create a, like a, a window somewhere to allow natural light and just film during certain hours? Is that an option? So it's like the, the mental energy, the the effort comes in trying to figure out where are my pivots mm-hmm. and, and being able to understand how you can pivot or where you can pivot. I think for us is, um, that's a skill. That's a skill on a, a higher level awareness. So one of the things that I, I genuinely believe was a saving grace for our company. And, and let, mm-hmm. let me go back a step here. Chaotic times like that are both a blessing and a curse, right? They're the blessing because they reveal inadequacies in your business, in your preparation, in your maneuverability, you know, all of those things from your social, emotional capacity to everything in your business. And that's, that's the blessing. They show you where you have opportunity to improve and they're the curse because in those areas you have the moment to feel kind of screwed. Right. Yep. Um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier prior to the podcast was having infrastructure in place as early as possible in your business life. I believe that infrastructure that we had spent so much time and effort building in our business is what allowed us to pivot so quickly and to be so effective. And had it not been for COVID running through the country in 2020, it may have taken us longer to find the gaps in our infrastructure that still needed filling. Do you follow totally. me there? 100%. What was that quote of your father's that was so, that I, mm, that yeah, I yeah, felt yeah. so brilliant? So when I was 
getting started in my own clinic. I, I worked for my father for two years to learn everything I felt like I could there. And then when it, when it was clear that the way that we wanted to practice were divergent for one another, uh, mm -hmm. I decided to go off and start my own, right? Mm -hmm. I, I knew everything. So I was going to go start mm -hmm. my own. <laughs> and I would see patients from nine until like 1230 and then from three o'clock to seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. And someone asked me if they could come in at 845. They saw I was already there because I would get in there at you know, 8.15 and get my day started. Uh, and they saw that I was there. The door was open. They walked in one time. Can I see you at 8.45? And I was like, uh, not today. Uh, what's your phone number? And I'll, I'll give you a call back. I say to my father, who, who had a lot of respect for his business acumen, I said, what do you think? Should I take this person at 8.45? And he was like, no. I said, why not? And he said, well, because you, you don't, your schedule will keep expanding. He's like, this is why you need somebody at your front desk. And I said, I can't afford to have somebody at my front desk. He's like, you need to have somebody at your front desk because they're going to set these boundaries and hold them for you. I said, dad, I can't afford to have somebody at my front desk. He says, Sean, you can't afford not to have somebody at your front Brilliant. desk. Right. It was, it was, you haven't achieved enough to have the luxury of letting everything go through you. Mm -hmm. And that was my first really valuable lesson in boundary setting and delegation of tasks that are not in my unique ability. These are lessons that I super wish, super wish that like every up and coming clinician, like everyone that's in any kind of pursuing any kind of medicine, anyone that's driven to become a presenter, anyone that's, that's thinking that there's a chance, there's even the slightest chance that they might be on that level of output to hear and to take to heart because like maybe I heard it or something, heard it, some heard something along those lines during my schooling. It didn't click. It didn't register. It didn't sink in. Um, and I've achieved what I've achieved in spite of myself. Like mm -hmm. I've had a lot of help along the way, certainly. And like I outsource certain things that I absolutely have no business touching, like my accounting. Thank God for my accountant, David it's godsend. But like, there's so much that um, I, I feel like had I had I had infrastructure, had I had like planned out, OK, this is what I need to have. This is these are the tasks that I need like fulfilled and I need to like outsource these to people. And I and I was more aware of that earlier on in the game. What a difference. What a difference that would have made for me. Well, like, for example, social well, media, right? Like to have someone that's like filming for you and someone that will like take those visual assets and edit for you without you having to be intimately involved in the process at every step of the way, man, like that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. The it's in, interestingly enough, you know, I, I picked and chose the lessons I wanted to take from my parents and the lessons that I didn't, you know, it, it, you said, you know, I, w I, I wish I had that lesson earlier on. And what, what I've gained from both taking the lessons and not taking the lessons is the ability to provide better service to my client, right? So, so if we take, for example, us trying to get this podcast scheduled, you mm -hmm. have a time that you have available for podcasting. Generally speaking, that time was not available for me. Had you mm -hmm. and I been talking, I would have moved something errandly mm -hmm. that would have cost somebody else, either on our team or a client of mine, um, mm -hmm. having to, change something and it, it causes the cascade downstream Ripple effect. Yep. The fact that I have someone on our team now who manages every element of my schedule mm -hmm. makes it so that you get the best service you can possibly get from me and from us. And if we think thank about you, you Sheila. right, thank you. Sheila is right. But if we can think about you like a client, it's the same thing for client meetings. I want, I need to meet with Sean. Okay. Please fill out this form so that we know what the meeting is about and then we'll, we'll set a time and all this kind of stuff. And we've had people who've asked, why do I need to fill out this form to speak with Sean? Well, because Sean wants to be able to help you as effectively as possible. And the best way he can help you do that is to force you to gather your thoughts prior to coming to the meeting, allow him to review them prior to meeting, and then mm -hmm. be able to have a meeting that's productive from the first second that you hop on the call. Instead of yep. having a meeting to set up the next meeting. Right. 
all of that comes as a result of her saying, it seems like we're double booking meetings because we're not getting enough done in the first one. What if we do this? So the amount of time that that saves me, if we add up the amount of dollars that I earn per hour, it's, it's, it's a huge leverage asset. 100%. And it's better for, 100%. The, and it's better for the client. So, yeah, I think a lot of us don't see that at the beginning because we're so, um, I can speak for myself. I mean, like when I was in my twenties, all I was worried about was like, am I going to be able to make enough money to pay the bills? Mm -hmm. You know, am I going to be able to make enough money so that I can be on a growth curve rather than like flirting with that, that like, where, where's my break even point? You know, I think being able to see ahead and, and think of the long game is something that, you know, more of us should be able to mentor the up and comers to say like, look, this may be lean right now, but you need to invest in this, 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 and this, um, so that you can have infrastructure so that you can like, when things hit, when people start referring, when you all of a sudden get stressed because now you're having to like schedule as well as treat as well as everything else that you don't have to do that. And you can allow them to go through whatever the, the gatekeeper is, mm -hmm. whether it's an app, whether it's a person, whether it's whatever, right. So that you can focus more on, on expressing your subject matter expertise. I think that it's, 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 you, you hit on a really valuable point there that early on, there's a big focus on money, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have these loans. I don't have this time. I need to make money to pay for the roof over my head and I will yep. take whatever patient, whatever client I can get at whatever time they will come to see me. And what happens is sure, do that for a little bit so that you can see it's unsustainable and it's not going to do what you think it's going to do. Right. But at the same time, the best way to focus on making more money is to provide a service to a client that they are compelled to tell their friends about. Yep. Right. So part of that is what are, where are all of the friction points that they experience when they go see somebody else? Being a better service can just be eliminating those friction points. Mm. And yeah, you're, you can't do that. Other people need to do that on your behalf so that you can be in service of your clients when they come. No, oh, 100%. I would say this, I would, this would be my spin on that. Like when you're fresh out of the gate or fresh out of school and you don't have an established clientele, like maybe at the very beginning so that you have some income, you take people or you take patients or you take clients or you take gigs that you ordinarily wouldn't classify as ideal, you know? And then once you've started to get some momentum and once you're, you're, time and your availability becomes less and less because now you've got some income and then you want to start funneling people into better hours. That's when you have to start being, uh, what's the right word? You have to be thinking ahead in terms of how do I funnel people out of these areas that are non-ideal into these slots that are ideal at the terms that you want as well. So being able to say, Hey, you know, like, I really appreciate you. Like you're, you've, you've been a long time patient of mine. Um, but these certain hours, like I can't make them work anymore. Let, let me have you come over here instead, mm -hmm. you know, inviting them to, to fit into your schedule, I think is something that like, we need to have those conversations about because a lot of young clinicians are like, Oh, well I'm inconveniencing them. Yeah. But like maybe the original time slot that you had them at, at the terms that you had them at is an ongoing inconvenience to you that limits you from growing mm -hmm. and helping them have the inventory of, uh, speech of dialogue of, of like a script to be able to say like, look, let me invite you into these slots instead. Like I've, I've saved these three slots. Maybe there's something that there that is totally like convenient for you, but I've saved these three slots for you. Can you, you know, which one of these would you like? Well, you know, the, the other side are, of I think, great. the other side of the coin on that is, yeah, you're inconveniencing them. That's true. Mm -hmm. Right now you're inconveniencing yourself and you think that's virtuous. Bingo. That's, that's going to turn into resentment for the patient who you're inconveniencing yourself over and over again. What happens yep. is you see them come in the schedule and you're like, oh, fuck, I forgot I have that guy at 7 a.m. Why are we supposed yep. to do this? And you're going to go in, you're going to put a smile on, oh, no, it's great. Everything is great. And you're not, your energy is not there because you resent that person for being in that time slot. That's the larger inconvenience, whether you realize it or not. 
that conversation needs to be had too. I mean, like the, the subtle, like passive aggressive stuff that like, oh, I wish, but like, just be aware of that. Like just to, to, to be able to have someone like if a mentor like you or me, like was able to communicate that to up and coming clinicians and or trainers or whatever the service field, the area of service is to be able to say, look, you, you provide a super service, but like, if you're not there, and you're resenting this person whom you've grandfathered in, thinking it was an act of largesse. But deep inside your heart, you're like resenting them because they're not at your ideal time. They're not at your ideal rate. They're, you know, mm-hmm. there's someone paying like the the r- relationship of you from 15 years ago. Like you need to you need you need to be the one to gatekeeper that. I think this goes to the um, excessive sensibilities that you've talked about or uh, sensitivities mm-hmm. that you talked about, yes. right? It's the, yes. it's the fear over conflict language. 100%. Can you speak to that? Um, gosh, I think we've gotten to the point where we're so afraid to, we're so afraid to ruffle feathers. We're so afraid to be canceled. We're so afraid to like engage because oftentimes we don't have the language to engage or we don't have the clarity to engage or we don't have like this kind of calmness in and of ourselves because we're afraid of getting canceled. We're afraid of getting rejected. We're afraid of like not making enough money. We're afraid of being ostracized. Um, That needs to be, I think for a lot of us dealt with head on. Like if we realize that we have an option have or options in terms of inventory of language of speech um, so that we can guide a relationship a particular way or guide outcomes a certain way um, while holding boundaries for ourselves um, and allowing us to give options as far as, okay, I'm holding my boundaries. This is what I need, but I'm still reaching out to you so that you can still connect with me through this pathway. That's more convenient or more safe or more like productive for me. Then I can then better serve you. To be able to articulate that, I think, is something that uh, a lot of us coming up don't have enough practice with. Where did you Where did you get your practice doing that? And I'll expand on mm. that question. Please do. I think I think that only happens as a result of conscious practice, because if we are if we fail to see when we've miscommunicated or been misunderstood or misunderstood somebody else. And we just assume I communicated perfectly clearly. I don't know why they did that. I don't know why they took it that way. I don't know why they're angry Mm -hmm. at me. Right. If we just, I don't know why. And then that's the end of it. It's their fault. Then we don't learn how we could have more effectively said the thing that we said. So where, where did you learn how to do this with intentional practice or how did you learn? I, to be totally honest, I think it was through relationships. Um, you know, uh, looking through my past relationships, there were often times when like, there's a, he said, she said, meaning like, well, I, I didn't say it, you know, you'll hear one side or the other say, well, I didn't say it like that. And in, in reality, the tone of voice was Mm -hmm. like a barking dog. Whereas like in, in their own mind or in their own perception, it was just like, they were speaking to you totally calmly and sweetly and whatever else. But like, if you actually recorded it, and had an objective listener listening to it, they'd be like, oh my God, that was really foul. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe you as the listener were, or me, let's say me as the listener might've been particularly sensitive. And in listening to the words after some time had passed, there was no particular malice or no particular intention of like um, irritation, but I just reacted to it in a way that was defensive. So I perceived it maybe as I was being barked at. So to avoid that kind of conflict, I thought about this a lot. And I remember I, I, this, this came on my radar, I think, in my 20s. And I just remember thinking like, man, there's so many times when I'm listening to couples arguing and my own experiences as well, where like one person is thinking they're saying things a certain way, but how the, how the words are coming out of their mouth is very different. And similarly, the listener, like there are times when like I'm listening to how something is being articulated and then watching the reaction. It's like, why is the reaction that particular way? And so to minimize those frictions, to use a a term that you use, those frictions, those disconnects, like 
I think it's super incumbent on the speaker to be able to slow the tempo, to be able to change pitch, to be able to back off and invite rather than to talk at somebody. And so the skills, like I think early on in the, in, for me in the, in the 20s just was like, wow, I need to, I need to pay more attention to this. I wish I got that in my twenties. I got it when I was about 33 years old and I re- dude, I'm still working on it and I'm 50. Oh, well, look to suggest that I think I'm done would be a huge error. I, I got awareness that I didn't know how to do it when I was 33. Mm-hmm. One of the first things that I learned from a mentor about communicating more effectively and intentionally was when somebody tells you something, when you're having, especially when you're having a conversation of magnitude, there's importance to it. When they tell you something, Ask them if you can repeat what they said. Mm-hmm. And so what would happen is people would, you know, pe- people could say a sentence in 7,000 different tones and emphasis and all that kind of stuff. And I was repeating what he, he advised, always repeat what they said in your own words. Because what that would do to me is it would force me to take into consideration the inclinations, you know, the, the low tones, all that kind of stuff and the words. And it was shocking to me how often people would say, no, that's not what I meant. Yeah. Where, where had I not done that, I would have been taking what I thought they meant, which was not what they meant, and responding to that, which could send you off in an entire conversation about something that neither of us were there to discuss. Right? Beautiful. So how do people get over these excessive sensitivities? Because mm. I, I'll, sh- I'll share a, an anecdote from my life yesterday that I think you'll relate to. Okay. My, my daughter was at Girl Scouts and they were making pizza at a local pizza place. She comes home and she's like, Daddy, I made, I made you and Mommy and my sister's pizza. And I'm like, oh, thanks. And I, I'm, I didn't really want to eat pizza, but of course I'm going to have a bite because my daughter made it. Sure. She says to me, it's just me, her, and my wife in the room at this time. She goes, is that the best pizza you ever had? And I said, it's not the best pizza I ever had. It's, I love it because you made it. But there are people who spend their entire lives trying to make great pizza. This is the first pizza you ever made. And you did a great job. And what I love about it is how fluffy the crust is. The su- You put the right amount of sauce on. And if you keep practicing, I think that you could make the best pizza I ever made one day. Mm. And I've I've heard other parents in similar situations, I don't mean to put myself on a pedestal here. I'm just speaking to my experience who, when their kid says something like that, they're like that, yes, it was so great. And I think that's a mistake mm-hmm. because I think that that breeds excesses, excessive sensitivity in those kids when they get older, because they're used to things just come easy. I made a pizza for the first time and dad said it was the best he ever had. Mm-hmm. Now, now you're telling me that you don't like my article that I wrote. No, your article sucks. So how, so how do we help people get over that when they're advanced age, when they're, when they're no longer children in our homes? Ooh, that's tough. When they're advanced age, that's, that's definitely tougher. And, you know, for me living with my parents now, like I moved my parents in during the pandemic, mm-hmm. you know, they were living in Delaware and, I'm, and, you know, being that my father's a known engineering, like I was like, you know, and I don't have siblings. So, mm-hmm. I was like, dad, you know, mom, it's time for you guys to just, I have room here. Like, just move in, like live out your golden years here. I can take care of you guys. You won't have to drive. You know, you can see your grandkids every day. Um, So those are the positives. The struggle sometimes is like, how do you communicate with someone who has their own perception of things and their own like, way they want to be talked to and the, their own like expectations of what they want to hear. Right. Like they want to hear that this is the best pizza they ever had that mm-hmm. you you've ever had. I think the tough thing behind that is that like, you know, you've got to somehow hold a line of reality, but smooth it so that you're not rushing to get to the point. Like, I think a lot, what really lies at the heart of the matter for a lot of us in, in terms of that conflict that you mentioned is impatience. Mm-hmm. So, like, if we can slow down enough to be able to connect first rather than communicate, this is the thing that I, I just it's constantly a struggle for me. Right. Like I'm thinking about information transfer, like 
how do how does Sean and I connect? How do we get like the information to the listeners on this podcast rather than taking the time to be patient enough to really connect? And so like making them feel like they're heard, making them feel like, oh, my God, he just said something that totally like that's part of my life. I feel that too. I feel like I'm struggling with time. Like I'm, I can't, I can't slow down enough because like, I want to get my point across. I want to make sure they understand me. But sometimes like the, the, the way of making someone feel understood or, or, can, or like the point did get across was to make sure that they were open first. And it isn't like saying, Hey, you have to be open to this. You have to be open to that. It's like create fostering a, a connection first so that there is natural openness Mm -hmm. Do you have dogs? I do now. Um, right. I, saw, yeah, I, I thought so. Yeah, I, so. Yeah, I just rescued one a couple of years, a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah. Well, before I had, I had, re, re, you know, a year ago, she crossed that rainbow bridge, but I had mm -hmm. a dog who we adopted, we rescued about, mm -hmm. I want to say two or three years before my first daughter was born. Wow. Awesome. The most, the most valuable thing I learned from that dog was I had to be a hundred percent present and ready to see something through if I was going to start it. And yep. so what that means is if I want my dog to sit, I need to be ready to spend an hour working on it. Cause if I tell her to sit and she doesn't and we end, she learns she doesn't have to take the cue. Right. right. So now with my daughters, my wife and I make a special effort to avoid things like yelling from the other room. Mm -hmm. Hey, can you come in for dinner? Cause they'll just ignore it. And then what happens is we can get frustrated because it's like, I just, I just asked you to come in for dinner. I didn't hear you. You did hear me. I know you heard me. Right. Um, but the truth is we just didn't make it important enough. And so right. going into the room and saying, Hey, it's dinner time. Let's turn the TV off. Come on in. We're going to eat. That's, that's a totally different situation. And it requires, as you were describing, far more patience. Yep. I, th there's a, this is, I think one of the, probably the most valuable lessons that my dad taught me as a kid, you know, just by exposing me to Tai Chi. Like there's an, there's a kind of, for lack of a better term, anxiety in life, right? Mm -hmm. Like you gotta, I gotta work hard. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. And there's like this frantic energy, right? Versus like, I've got to be able to slow down and like shed all of that frantic energy so I can just be able to take inventory of where I can't relax or where I can't, where I don't have the control to be able to like let that become water off a duck's back. You know, we get so enamored with like, you know, tension is strength. Yes. Tension is strength and tension that you can't let go of becomes pathological. That's the other part of the sentence there. Right. So having the ability to become aware first aware of that that lack of control and then being able to then address that and start you know kind of sanding down that level of tension to the point where it's like i can ratchet it up i can ratchet it down either way like i'm in control i can i can make it what it needs to be in a way that's contextually relevant mm -hmm. like that's a skill that i think we should all be spending a little bit more of our brain cells on yeah one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because I love the way that you and your daughter interact. You know, I love the way that uh, we were discussing earlier that parenting is really the highest form of professional coaching because it's, mm, it's, beautiful. it's 24 seven and you don't, you don't get to have off days. Nope. Um, so when my daughter, there was a day, maybe six months, a year ago, whatever it was at this point, my, my daughter was doing something and I got really frustrated and I raised my voice mm -hmm. and she left the room and she's, she was seven and I came up to her room cause I felt bad. I'm like, I can tell she was upset and I asked her, why did you leave the room? And she explains to me in a very clear way, when you raise your voice, it scares me and it makes mm -hmm. me uncomfortable. It, it makes me sad. And so I, I don't want to be in the room and I have a hard time talking to you when you raise your voice like that. And she was seven. And I was like, holy shit. I can never do that again. Like ever. No matter how frustrated I get. 
that has been one of the hardest things to avoid doing because it's like, well, the easy thing, the lazy thing is to just get louder because she can't get as loud as I can get. Sure. But it goes back to the, the professional coaching of it. My student, my client gave me a cue about how they learn. And if it's mm-hmm. about them and not me, I need to meet them where they are. And so, right. so, so one of the things that I see that you do that I love is you train your daughter martial arts. And I don't, I mean this in the, in the kindest way. I don't care that you teach her martial arts. I care how you teach her martial arts, the patience that you exhibit when she's staying on the center line or whatever the case might be. Mm-hmm. Did she ask you for that coaching? Did you suggest that coaching? How did that relationship element foster? So as far as martial arts go with my kids, I basically told them like, look, there are going to be certain expectations of you because you're my kids. Like pe- the public, people that interact with me um, or who are around me may interact with you a certain way or have certain expectations of you because of my background. Would you share um, with the audience certain- who, who don't know that background? Oh, okay. Um, I've done a little bit in terms of martial arts. Um, I, gosh, where do I start? Uh, I don't know that there's a Cliff Notes version of this. And I always struggle with this when I'm asked because like I have, I have a little bit of a back, like I said, a little bit of a background. Um, I just some highlights. I taught do, 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 at UCLA. Do you want, do you want me to, to give you a narrower perspective to look at it through? Would that be helpful? Sure, please. What are the things that you believe people know about you that are going to have them look at your children differently? Um, it depends on who the people are that come up. Like there are some people that might approach me who know of me through the martial arts. Right. And so like my background in the martial arts, some of those people know of me as like um, either I was teaching at UCLA for teaching Kung Fu at UCLA for a few years, uh, for several years. Um, I was uh, a contributing editor of Black Belt Magazine. Uh, I wrote articles on some of the, you know, some of the martial arts luminaries from around the world. Um, I've had the privilege of studying and training and uh, achieving instructorship in several different styles. So because of these people that are, that know of me through the martial arts, they may approach me with a certain kind of vibe. And then they may see my kids thinking that they automatically have a certain level of proficiency. Mm-hmm. So I, I told them, I was like, there may be people that expect certain things of you just because you're with me. So I'd like you to have a certain level of familiarity so that whatever goes down, whether it's verbally, whether it's physical, whatever, right. You have a context through which to not be caught out of, out of sorts. Have they ever found the need to use that? Um, my daughter, no, my son has on occasion, um, Mm -hmm. on one occasion in particular. And I thought that was, it was rather humorous. Um, but yeah, you know, they, the, my daughter, I think as a 10 year old, by and large, she's really like one of these super sweet, happy-go-lucky types um, who tends to be just aware enough to be able to position herself away from people who are mm-hmm. um, on the rambunctious end. Well, I think um, one of the most valuable elements of martial arts in general is mm-hmm. that when you – I'll speak for myself. I haven't trained nearly as much as you. I haven't accomplished nearly as much as you have. Um two years one-on-one with an instructor in Taekwondo and some, some groundwork. I'm much calmer because I know that I'm much less likely to get into an altercation because I know that I don't feel the need to bump up against people emotionally in such a way that they would submit, if you will, you know, mentally and socially to me because they don't want the the potential of like, I'm just way calmer. And I think it's so valuable for kids to have that too, because it's at the end, like if, if you really trace the thoughts back, right? Why yes. does it, why does it bother me that this kid has given me a hard time? Well, because I, I asked him to stop and he didn't stop. Okay. Well, what's mm-hmm. next in your mind? I could go to the teacher but I don't want to go to the teacher. And even if I did, what's the teacher going to do? It's just going to be harder for me after school. And they keep going down the line to, well, I'm going to end up in a fight with this kid and I might lose and get hurt and embarrassed and all of that. If you have the martial arts training, 
I believe you have the ability to see all the way to the end and be like, it, it's, it's him who really doesn't want this energy. And so I'm going to meet him in a different place and share that I don't think this is something that is wise to engage in. And that's a different level of calm, at least for me. And, and it's something that I want to teach on to my kids, not teach them, but have someone else who knows how to teach them. Teach them. Sure. I mean, for me, I, I think with my kids, I, I take a, a slightly different approach. I, I told my kids, I was like, look, if you get in a fight and worst case scenario is you lose and you not only lose, but you lose and get severely injured. So that's the worst case scenario, right? Like no matter what. Second worst case scenario is you win, but you get but you hurt the other kid. And then you have to now spend so much more of your time to explain to authorities as far as why and possibly pay penalties. Right. So you may have physically won, dominated that particular situation. But in the long run, you lose. Mm-hmm. I was like, you have to examine all of the liabilities. Right. Like, what is it worth it to you to kick someone's ass? Like, does it make you a winner in terms of? efficiency, time, everything else, where in terms of your energy, or are you just doing it just because your ego is so damn fragile? Mm -hmm. Like to me, martial arts is an examination of liabilities. Where are your liabilities? Like, do you really want to spend all of that time, all of that energy, risk your physical well-being, risk your reputation, everything else, just to be able to dominate someone physically? Maybe. Not worth it. Not worth it. 100% not worth it. So like Tim Larkin, of all people, who's uh, like a big brother to me, um, he's the founder of a a system called Target Focus Training um, and one of the most sought after uh, close quarter combat um, experts in the world. Tim Larkin tells of a vignette where he was cut off. Um, He was driving with his son and I think he either accidentally cut off someone else or someone else cut him off. But this guy is driving next to Tim and screaming at him out the window, flipping him off. And Tim's son is in the car with him. Tim's boys in the car with him. And then like in the console right between Tim and his son is a copy of black belt magazine where Tim is on the cover. And so Tim's son is like, this guy is flipping Tim off screaming and yelling. There's this magazine and Tim's son like picks up the magazine and is going like this, like dad, this is you. Why don't you do something about mm-hmm. it? And then Tim has that convo with his conversation with the son saying like, dude, like if I did something and let's say, he pulls out a gun, then what? And you're here. Like he plays out all the scenarios. And then like, there are all of these possible things that could go wrong. And even if they quote unquote go right, it's still, it's still not worth it because what if he leaves and then he's angry and then he goes in like, let's say, because he's more angry because he didn't quote unquote win the situation with Tim. What if he then engages in another worse, more severe road rage incident later on with someone else or goes home and beats up his wife and kids or goes home and does something else. Like there are ways of letting that kind of karmic anger and energy just disperse. And if you don't choose to react, if you don't choose to be triggered, then you allow that to just kind of dissipate. And I think that was a beautiful, I I gotta, I gotta find that post. Um, Tim talks about it in one of the, one of his podcast interviews, but I think it's, it's so spot on for people to hear. Well, I think the way that you just described all of that is the reason why you're the instructor and I'm not when it comes to, (laughs) (laughs) it was beautiful. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where, um, you want it more than say your daughter wants it? Meaning martial arts for her. So, so for example, my, 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 I'm asking, I'm now getting a coaching lesson here. I hope you're okay with okay, it. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, of course. My daughter, right. Would lo- like, she likes to play around with me and I can teach her very, very, very basic things in a very imperfect mm-hmm. way. Um, I would love to get her working with somebody who knows what they're doing. She doesn't want to do it. She just doesn't like the, the, the social environment of it, the, the other kids, all of that kind of stuff. Fine. I never know how much to push to be like, you, you should do this. You would like doing this. This would be valuable for you as compared to pulling and saying, would you like to do this? I would love, you know, if, if you're interested, of course I could help you. I would probably approach that. The strategy I would apply would be like, Hey, let's make a deal. Like figure out something that she wants or that she thinks she wants and go, Hey, I make you a deal take lessons of whatever that pursuit is, right? Like Taekwondo, Jiu Jitsu, Wing Chun, whatever it is, like whatever is close and that you think that she might resonate with. 
and go like, hey, you know, I want you to just do me this favor. Here's a deal. You take lessons, do these lessons, do these classes for three months. Three months at the end of the three months, if you do pretty well, you come up, you come into each class with a decent attitude, you train hard. At the end of those three months, if you don't want to continue and you really want to bail, okay, you gave it a wholehearted effort. And here's a reward. If you want to continue, here's the here's the reward that I promised you, and you get to continue. So either way you win or what you win, mm-hmm. right? And then you also, as the parent, get the satisfaction of knowing that you sat there through each lesson, watched how she was, watched how she interacted, watched how she trained, watched her um, evolution or her struggles. Because sometimes like we think a certain style or a certain school or a certain whatever place or a certain endeavor is going to be awesome for our kids. But for whatever reason, the chemistry is just not right. We've got to be humble enough to just be able to say like, okay, you know what? I thought this was going to be awesome for you. Maybe not. Mm-hmm. Like maybe I like, oh, this teacher is really well rated and really highly thought of and really um, decorated in terms of as a piano instructor. But I put you in into the environment of learning from from her. And I can see that the, the vibe isn't right. Like you're you're really like wilting. Then you're right. Like, let's find you someone else. Mm-hmm. We have to, we as parents have to be responsible enough and honest enough to go like yeah i thought this was a good idea but yeah let's 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 pivot let's find something else well that's that sensitivity again right it's 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 the durability to the sensitivity because part of that is the ego of the parent potentially saying no no i i thought this through i found this instructor this is i set the, i set you up with them i paid good money for it, it was wrong it's yep. okay it was wrong it was an input uh mm-hmm. So I think I think everything does keep coming back to being reasonably sensitive to things in a way where that sensitivity is really just a a measure, not a reaction. <clears throat> right? Like I, I'm sensitive in that I see this is going on, not I'm sensitive in that it's causing me to react in this way. Right. That's positive sensitivity. I mean, like I think a, a, an ideal positive sensitivity is just simply willing to be wrong. Mm-hmm. Like if someone were to ask me what's the secret to my quote unquote success, whether it's like in terms of movement, in terms of strength training, in terms of martial arts, in terms of parenting, whatever, go down the list, whatever the area of human endeavor is, it's willing to be wrong. And if I can accept that there's a possibility that I'm wrong, then I can be open to seeing what other opportunities there are to improve, to, to latch on, to grow. Right. So with, with our kids, it's super important. Like with my daughter, for example, right. I'll train her as often as I can. But there are some days when she's just not having it. Now, if I'm working with a rehab client, for example, right? Like in, let's say that day I want to be working on squats, but their body, their body language, their, their mechanics, just for whatever reason that day, they're, they're just not able to dial in mentally, physically, the coordination, whatever. And maybe I've seen them squat beautifully before, but that day they're just not having it. I need to be able to get, present them with other options that are still going to be productive for them and enjoyable. So with her, right? Like there are times when she's just not into training, maybe the thing that I thought that she was going to want to train, like let's say working on the steel whip, mm-hmm. um, which is one of the weapons that we have in classical Chinese martial arts. Well, maybe that day training is going to be, okay, let's just go in the backyard and just throw knives. Maybe she's like, I, I don't want to do that. Okay, great. Then let's play catch with the medicine ball. Like those are still building attributes. Those are still giving them some kind of out, some kind of stimulus that develops a positive outcome, that eustress, rather than like, I do this thing resentfully. That's a distress, Mm -hmm. you know? So the more, again, options, the more inventory we have as far as options, the more productive we can be. Early on in the podcast, you talked about when COVID hit, you mm-hmm. told your patients, you're not going to be able to earn if your body is in pain and you're not able to focus. So don't worry about the money right now. If you don't have it, mm-hmm. I still want to take care of you. Yep. I believe that what happened there is your patients, your clients got to see the real reason why Mark Cheng was taking care of them. And you were doing it without the expectation of anything in return, you were doing it because you genuinely wanted for them to get the results that they had come to you for, regardless of 
what it ended up doing for you financially. Mm -hmm. I believe that's part of the reason why when we were talking in the pre-show, you said you didn't think you would have enough money after a few months, but now your schedule is so full that you don't know what to do with yourself because people, (laughs) because people know they can rely on Mark Chen for the right reasons. So my question to you now is, you also said that before the pandemic, your K3 combat movement systems was mm-hmm. movement systems, right? They get that. They, yeah, correct. Was taking off. Yes. And then you haven't done it since. <clears throat> we haven't done a live workshop since. No. Is that coming back? That's on the, that's on the rest. That's on the roster of things that we need to do. Um, right now, the difficulty is that both me and my um, co-developing partner, co-founder, Jim Yuen, Dr. Mm-hmm. Jim Yuen, we're both so freaking nuts as far as like workload right now. Uh, you know, we joke about this back and forth all the time via text, but it's like, you know, running around like two Chinamen pulling burning rickshaws. It's, <laughs> it's just like, it's psycho busy. I mean, it's, uh, there are things that we want to be able to do, but I think both of us are, um, have the blessing slash curse that, we get to do work we love with people that we really dig um, and we both get paid a pretty penny for it. So it's, it's, it's a tough thing because like we all have these different opportunities. How do we set it up to make 72 hours out of 24, mm-hmm. you know, more infrastructure. Yeah, it's tough, <laughs> but honestly, okay. like infrastructure has limits because you know, when you're getting paid to paid so well to work with people who want and appreciate and benefit from your service and mm-hmm. benefit from time with you. And, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to keep a certain amount of hours for your kids or a certain amount of time for the parents, a certain amount of time just for you to unplug mm-hmm. time and your presence become a and good. You know, you have to be, um, you have to look at at a certain point, like what brings you the most joy and is balancing out like that joy with like what pays you the most other rewards as well. Yeah. The, the, only, yeah, I mean, I, the only infrastructure ahead. that would afford you the ability to do that would be to duplicate yourself, which, which mm. if, which, which is only worth doing if you'd rather be doing something else. And, and that's the question. That's the tough thing because like, I love, honestly, like I love the thought of being able to do workshops I want to be at a point where I can do those, but like, there's too much. Uh, this was the aha moment for me, I think in late 2022, um, because I was still making good money, still solvent, still, still able to, you know, have house repairs being done. Uh, damn, I have so much opportunity being able to prioritize them and still say no to opportunities has been like, that's been a breakthrough for me. Like I, I know for a lot of people, they're pretty good at saying no. Like I w- I always came up thinking like, you got to throw irons in fire because you'll be lucky if one comes up hot. I never anticipated that like I'll put irons in fires and like all of these fuckers are coming up hot now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, like I said, it caught, uh, as we were talking during the pre-show, it kind of caught me with my pants down. Never expected that in terms of martial arts, like, I'd have access to the kinds of masters that I do. Never expected that they'd want to teach me. Never expected, you know, the kind of like attention that I get from them. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. Not to mention work opportunities, being able to work with the kind of patients that I do. Uh, and they're like, these are some really dope people. I, I really just, you know, I'm at a loss for words all the time when I think about trying to express the joy of being able to do the work that I do with the people that I get to work with. I mean, like I've often said that I dig these people so much and I dig the vibe and I dig making progress with them that even if I wasn't getting paid when I'm getting paid, I'd probably still work with them. Well, and, and again, that, that boils down to you're, you're, you're in that zone of genius right now where it's mm. fulfillment, ability, money, passion, Vision, they're all like if you do a Venn diagram with all of them, you're hitting the bullseye yeah. in the very middle yeah. where all of those things are aligned. And so the idea of doing a workshop <clears throat> is great. You would love to be able to do a workshop. But the things you would need to do 
to do a workshop right now would take too much of the things that you are loving doing away to be worth it to do. And so the right. time, the time is wrong until the time is. Yeah, it, it's totally that. I mean, like, you know, people talk about uh, romantic relationships and it's like, if you're committed and you're happy and like the person that you're, you're partnered with, let's say at the moment is like the person that brings you that like overwhelming sense of joy. Right. Do you leave that to go with someone else? And it, you know, I understand that there are multiple different level, like kinds of relationship dynamics, but in a, in a predominantly monogamous one, like that doesn't work. I mean, like I'm with this one, this makes me so happy. Like granted there may be other options and stuff like that, but I'm here and I'm, and I'm, I'm, thrilled to be here mm -hmm. uh is there anything that i didn't ask you that you think would be valuable for the audience to know mm, i think i want to go circle back around on and reemphasize that that willing to be wrong point that i made earlier like if you want to grow if you want to be happy like if you want to be healthier if you want to be able to provide that not only for yourself in terms of enjoying that, but also give other people that you're, you're close to more of that. Be willing to be wrong. Be willing to see like, ah, oh, you know, like I did this, but there are so many other better ways of, of doing the, this task, whatever that is. And so like, if you think of wrong and then, you know, let your head circle down into a spiral of blame and like judgment and harshness and, and contracture, that won't be productive. But if you understand wrong as like, okay, there are way better ways of me doing something, then you'll always be on a growth trajectory. And you'll like from one moment to the next, from one opportunity to the next, from one struggle to the next, instead of being triggered and locked down, you'll find that like those kinds of struggles, those kinds of opportunities, those kinds of challenges actually hit you like a eustress. They, they fertilize you. They help you grow. I love that. And I'll leave it on that. Where can people find you, Doc? Um, I'm on socials at at D-R-M-A-R-K-C-H-E-N-G. So that's at Dr. Mark Chang on Insta, Facebook, and Twitter. Awesome. Thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Honored to. And great to finally spend time with you face-to-face. -face. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Live Podcast. Please remember, give us a hand, rate it, review it wherever you listen to shows. We are on a mission to humanize the healthcare industry by professionalizing the fitness industry to empower the individual to live a life unlimited by the way that their body looks, feels, or performs. If you are inspired by that mission and want to jump on the wagon, find us anywhere. Active Life Professional on Instagram. Active Life Rx on Instagram. Come to me personally at Dr. Sean Pastuch. We want to welcome you onto the train. We want you to be a part of the mission. We want to offer you the opportunity to pursue this right alongside us. We're inspired by your effort, and we hope to help you in your journey. Turn broke.